Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the executive director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kufferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's talk, paragraph 175, The Contemporary Impact of Nazi-Era Homophobia and Persecution, features our guest speaker, Dr. Jake Newsom, scholar and author of Pink Triangle Legacies, coming out in the shadow of the Holocaust. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York, is situated on the traditional land of the Mentinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, psychological, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and Indigenous communities. Our event today is part of the 2023-24 KHC and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Weaponizing the Past, Art, History, and the Rhetoric of National Greatness. It's organized by the KHC and co-sponsored by the QCC CUNY LGBTQIA plus consortium, the Ray Walpaw Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights at Western Washington University, the Center for the Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, the Holocaust and Human Rights Center in White Plains, and the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University. Now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming this year's KHC NEH faculty fellows, Dr. Kathleen Alves and Dr. Eliza Atik. Dr. Kathleen Tamayo Alves is Associate Professor and Deputy Chair of English at Queensborough Community College. Her research centers on 18th century literature and culture, medicine, and literary history, and she has recently published in Studies in 18th Century Culture, 18th Century Fiction, Afroben Online, and The Rambling. Her forthcoming book, Body Language, Medicine in the 18th Century Comic Novel, explores how medicine shaped and is shaped by common language through fictional dramatizations of female-specific medical phenomena such as menstruation, hysteria, and pregnancy. Dr. Eliza Atik is Associate Professor of English at Queensborough Community College. She focuses on the discourses of power, violence, and marginalization. She's published also on the functioning of affect and emotion in Israeli cinema, and on the pedagogy of teaching about mass violence and genocide. Dr. T co-organized the 2016-2017 KHC NEH Colloquia, Fleeing Genocide, Displacement, Exile, and the Refugee, as well as was a participant in the 2019 U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's faculty seminar entitled Disability, Eugenics, and Genocide, Nazi Germany, Its Antecedents and, its Antecedents and Legacy. Dr. Atik teaches classes on literature of the Holocaust, popular culture, and literary theory, along with multiple composition courses, and she is currently one of QCC's representatives to the CUNY LGBTQIA plus council. Dr. Alves, Dr. Atik, the floor is yours. Welcome, and uh, thank you for being here. Today's event is the fourth in our colloquium titled Weaponizing the Past, Art, History, and the Rhetoric of National Greatness. As a series, we aim to understand how nostalgia, narrative, and what Walter Benjamin termed the asceticization of political life functioned in the Nazi state. We also look at contemporary movements that use idealized and often fictionalized pasts to justify exclusionary ideologies and the ramifications for those who don't conform to those romanticized national histories. Today's event will focus on the Nazi era implementation of paragraph 175 particularly revisions to the legislation that allowed for more direct persecution of gay lives during the Nazi era. We will also look at its afterlives in current laws and discriminatory measures directed toward the LGBTQIA community. The German law, known as paragraph 175, was written in 1871 during the German empire. And while it criminalized what was uh, known as, quote, unnatural acts between men, it was mostly interpreted in a narrow way and typically required evidence of intercourse to be enforceable. In fact, 
Through the Weimar Republic years, areas like Berlin had active gay communities, despite the laws on the book. Around this same time, there was also an increasing interest in the discipline of sexology and the beginnings of a broader understanding of human sexuality. In Germany in 1897, Magnus Hirschfeld founded the Scientific Humanitarian Committee that, among other things, argued that homosexuality was a human trait rather than a vice and advocated for the reform of paragraph 175, though that was ultimately unsuccessful. In 1919, Hirschfeld founded the Institute for Sexual Research, which helped promote and support women, gay, and transgender people, and offered, among other services, gender-affirming care. Hirschfeld's scholarship and his Jewishness threatened the normative and nationalistic framework imposed by the Nazis around sexuality and became a target for censorship and censure in the form of state-sponsored book burnings. As noted during previous events, when Hitler became chancellor of Germany in 1933, one of his earliest policies was to promote the Nazification of the state. In this phenomena, allegedly outsider influences, those seen as contrary to German values, were deliberately named as degenerate and were erased through the workings of state-controlled media. In this 1933 national action against the German spirits, book burnings took place, including at Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Research, which was surrounded, looted, and its books publicly burned. Captured by German newsreels and played all over the country, this vast archive, including many books on the history of gender nonconformity, was consumed by fire and much of the Institute's research was lost. As Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda explained, the goal of these book burnings was, quote, to entrust to the flames the intellectual garbage of the past, end quote. The Nazi state also soon revised paragraph 175 so that the law now applied more broadly and added new text to make it more prosecutable, which indeed it became. However, and I quote, we don't want any of that filth in our state, end quote, was not a statement made during the Nazi takeover of Germany in 1933, but one made just several weeks ago by Oklahoma State Senator Tom Woods as a justification for the pervasive anti-LGBTQ plus language and legislation promoted by his state. Woods' statement was made after the bullying death of Nex Benedict a 16-year-old indigenous and non-binary student and meant to defend the aggressive discourse and laws that are currently on the rise, particularly those tra uh, targeting trans transgender people. Right now in 2024, here in the US, the ACLU is currently tracking 479 anti-LGBTQ law bills in the United States. At least 510 anti-LGBTQ laws were introduced in state legislat legislatures last year, with 75 of them becoming law. Supporters of this movement often claim that they are, quote, protecting a sense of religious liberty and protecting a conformity to a retroactively constructed notion of traditional values that, to them, demands the exclusion and sometimes erasure of those out of conformity with this norm. These powerful and dangerous acts of persecution, utilizing similar rhetoric, is part of what we seek to explore today. I'd like to now turn this event over to my colleague, Dr. Kathleen Alves, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Atik. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jake Newsom. Dr. Jake Newsom is an award-winning scholar of German and American LGBTQ plus history whose research and resources educate global audiences. He is the founder and director of the Pink Triangle Legacies Project, which honors the memory of the Nazis queer victims and carries on their legacy by fighting homophobia and transphobia today through education, advocacy, and empowerment. His book, Pink Triangle Legacies, Coming Out in the Shadow of the Holocaust, published by Cornell University Press, 
tells the dynamic and inspiring history of the LGBTQ plus community's original pride symbol. It traces the transformation of the pink triangle from a Nazi concentration camp badge into a widespread emblem of queer liberation, pride, and community. He lives in San Diego with his husband and son. Dr. Newsom. Right. Good morning and, and or afternoon um, or maybe even evening to everyone, depending on where you are joining from. Um, I, I, Dr. Uh, Aves and Atik, I, I really appreciate um, that that introduction and, and the framing of what we're going to be talking about for the next uh, 45 minutes. I listening to Dr. Atik talk at um I really appreciate that that kind of setting up because now um, the the history that I would like to to present to all of you um, and then have time to discuss afterwards will really be able to kind of zoom in and give a a, a deeper um, examination of these themes that that she laid out. Um, before I before I move forward, I do just want to. Um, oh, it says that I need um, permission to to share my screen. I will say that I'm extremely appreciative of the Kupferberg uh, Center and the really uh, impressive list of co-sponsors. Um, as as Dr. Atik mentioned, we there, yeah, we find ourselves in a time in the United States where um, really both of these histories, Holocaust history and LGBTQ topics, are uh, under attack, and and school boards across the country are trying to pass um, policies that either rewrite or restrict or just completely ban um, classroom instruction about these topics. And so it's incredibly important uh, that our coalition of, of co-sponsors have created this, this digital space for us to come together and, and, and learn um, from each other and, and with each other. So I want to start um, my talk this, I, I'm going to keep saying this morning, I, I, I'm in California, so it's still bright and early over here. Uh, I would like to start um, the talk this morning by sharing the story of a man named Richard Gruna, who you can see here on your screen. Uh, Richard was um, born in the fall of 1903 in Flensburg, which is a small coastal city along the, the German-Danish border. Uh, he had a relatively um, well-to-do upbringing. He was one of eight children, uh, but his father had a, had a very good job, and so they led an um, upper-middle-class lifestyle. From early on, Richard knew that he wanted uh, to study art, and he traveled all across Germany and uh, Europe more broadly to, to visit museums, and he even moved uh, in February of 1933 to Berlin so that he could study um, at the world-famous Bauhaus Institute for Art and Design. But really, art wasn't the only thing that, that drew him to Berlin. Uh, after the end of World War I, uh, when the German Empire uh, was, the, the emperor was forced to abdicate the throne and a democracy was established, uh, it became known as the Weimar Republic. Um, minorities, including uh, sexual minorities and gender nonconforming folks, gained a, a certain level of uh, political rights that they hadn't before. And at least in the large urban centers like the capital city of Berlin, what you witnessed was a burgeoning LGBTQ um, community, and, and at least in Berlin, it was quite public. Uh, this wasn't something that was just kind of kept under underground. Um, really, uh, by the 1920s, Berlin kind of became a queer and trans capital of the world. People traveled there from London and New York and Paris um, to to experience this level. I don't want to say full acceptance, uh, but at least a level of tolerance that that wasn't um, wasn't available anywhere else in the world. Uh, in Berlin alone, there were over one hundred. Uh, nightclubs, bars, cafes, organizations that catered either exclusively to a queer clientele or at least made it known that they were a safe space for them. And so on your screen, you can see um, the, the largest and most famous of those, which was called the El Dorado. Uh, and the, the motto here on the screen or, or, or on their um, entrance says here, it's it's OK. Um, now. At the same time, Germany had a, an incredibly vibrant LGBTQ 
network of publications. And so if you were queer or trans and you, no matter if you were interested in sports or politics or art or, or current events, you could find a daily newspaper or a weekly magazine um, for, for your interest. And so we the research shows now that there was a combined readership of about a million people in Germany who were reading these um, LGBTQ publications. Um, Germany at the time was also a forerunner. Um, well, I guess I should say Berlin mostly. Um, Berlin was a forerunner in trans, uh, you know, the study of and the promotion of trans culture and trans rights. And so just to kind of demonstrate that, I wanted to share the story of Gerd Kotter, who was a trans man born in Berlin. Um knew from, he, he was assigned female at birth, but knew from very early on um, that he was, you know, he was a man, um, started going by Gerd. And in, uh, when he became a teenager, um, uh, I think he was 16 at the time, went to uh, the Institute for Sexual Science that Dr. Atik mentioned at the beginning, um, which was headquartered there in Berlin and that provided uh, healthcare, um, community service, researches, uh, research um, on queer and trans communities. And one of the things that Gerd was able to do was get actually get a medical certificate, which you can see here, uh, that was signed by Magnus Hirschfeld, um, that essentially said that medically speaking, Gerd was what was known at that time as a transvestite. Um, and that actually, the, the doctor's note translated says that it's in the best interest of Gerd uh, to be able to present uh, and, and dress in the clothes publicly that align with their uh, inner, uh, inner sense of self. And so Gerd was able to take this so-called transvestite pass to the police, Berlin Police Department, um, and they issued Gerd a, an official, um, essentially a new gender-affirming ID card uh, that had the, the stamp of the uh, police department and they were able to carry this with them uh, in the effort to help protect them against uh, laws on the books that, that criminalized um, cross-dressing. And so really, this is a, a, an incredibly progressive um, community here in Berlin. Now, just because a lot of the social ideas um, and, and, and thoughts changed, that doesn't mean that the laws uh, necessarily kept up with those social changes. And so um, Dr. Atik mentioned uh, paragraph 175, which is really the focus of this event today. Um, and it had existed in Germany since the unification of the country in 1871. Uh, and here you can see the original wording of that law. Um, and I will say that, that here when it says, um, it, it, it provide sorry it applied specifically um to 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 men um this was it, it you know even though it kind of used the the larger humans um it it applied specifically to men and we'll talk about why women were included um in in just a moment now um this law as i said it had uh, it had existed since 1871. It continued to exist during the Weimar Republic. In Berlin, the police decided that um, sexual acts between two, two consenting adults was kind of a victimless crime. And so in Berlin, they stopped or almost stopped enforcing paragraph 175. But really, in the smaller towns and throughout the rest of Germany, um, the the local law enforcement's actually ramped up their uh, their enforcement of paragraph 175. And we have quotes of people talking about, we don't want that homosexual lifestyle spreading from the capital into the rest of Germany. And so what we actually see, if you look at the national numbers of convictions under paragraph 175, uh, they actually rise during the, the Weimar Republic. Um, that's they, they fall in the capital, but they go up everywhere else. Now, uh, in the late 1920s, um, the Nazi party is still a, a rather small kind of fringe party, but by the end of the 1920s and into the early 1930s, they really are cons um, uh, consolidating uh, political support. And by 1932, they, they win a majority in parliament. In January of 1933, Hitler, their, their party's leader, is appointed 
chancellor of the country. And the Nazis are, um, as they are trying to build a new uh, master race for Germany, they're obsessed with understanding and then controlling human sexuality. Because in their mind, right, the um, sex and, and is, is literally the key to reproducing the, the so-called master race. And so they believed that LGBTQ folks robbed the fatherland of children, of the next generation of good Nazi offspring. And so for the Nazis, this really was a, a central threat. Uh, they, they, they viewed, um, you know, uh, queerness and gender nonconformity as not just kind of a, a immoral sin, but as a direct racial threat to the to the uh, birth rate of the of the fatherland, and also as a threat to the stability of the the actual government and the state itself. So, in uh, March of 1937, uh, the the Schwarze Kor, which was the um, newspaper of the SS, and uh, the SS. Uh, was the organization that ultimately ran the concentration camp um, system, uh, ran a front page article in which um, you can see it's underlined actually in red here on the on the newspaper uh, that, that they're talking about, uh, of course, what they called homosexuals, um, and they, they classified them as enemies of the state. Now, one thing I do want to point out um, is that the Nazis believed that people weren't born um, queer or born trans. Uh, they believed that um, essentially everyone was born straight and that some people simply gave into a lifestyle of degeneracy, um, just the same way they kind of viewed it as, as you know, alcoholism or gambling, that this was something that people um, gave into, and yes, they might become addicted to it. Um, so they they really focused their their rhetoric and their propaganda on combating um, what they called the homosexual lifestyle. And so, um, as we will see, their their policies, at least officially, remained um, that they would try to cure or re-educate. Germans who had fallen into this homosexual lifestyle. They would try to cure them and then reintegrate them back into society. Um, but as we will see, there's there's a, a massive difference between the official policy on the one hand and the reality on the other, because the Nazis' policies against uh, the LGBTQ community were ultimately uh, in, in incredibly deadly and, and torturous. So... Immediately after coming to power, the Nazis um, pass a number of laws, essentially, where they um, are, are kind of broad, broad and vague enough um, that gives them power to, to navigate uh, the complexities of the LGBTQ community. Um, and so, for example, in Hitler comes to power at the end of January, already by February, they pass a law that... Um, or places and organizations of immorality have to be shut down. Well, of course, that gives them kind of uh, a, a free slate to define that how they want to. And so um, LGBTQ nightclubs, meeting places, cafes, organizations are all shut down. And so here actually is a picture of that, of the El Dorado. And you can see that it's been shut down. Um, it's being guarded by police and there's swastikas all over the, the windows and posters telling people to uh, vote for Hitler in the next presidential election. The next thing that the Nazis do is try to ban all LGBTQ publications. I mean, almost overnight now, that vast network of newspapers and magazines is, is illegal um, and, and essentially disappears. Uh, they also, uh, as Dr. Atik mentioned, uh, rooted, uh, sorry, looted um, the Institute for Sexual Sciences library, and they burn over 20,000 books and articles and documents uh, in the infamous book burnings of, of May of 1933. And so on the one hand, the Nazis are trying to silence all avenues in which LGBTQ people can speak for themselves. Um, on the other hand, they are they are ramping up their propaganda machine and portraying 
queer and trans people as threats to Germany's youth. They're telling parents, you know what, you might not agree with our policies on geopolitics or or the economy, but we know that you're good parents and you want to protect your children from this homosexual lifestyle. Now, um, the Nazis targeted anyone whose gender uh, or, or sexuality didn't conform to their kind of ideas of, of tradition. Um, here we see, for example, uh, a person named Fritz Kitzing, who um, we, the historical archive suggests was um, a self-identified gay man um, who also cross-dressed um, for at least some parts of, of their life. Uh, he, Fritz was arrested um, in men's clothes, uh, sorry, in women's clothing multiple times uh, under the Nazi regime, but was uh, arrested under the German law for um, the law against homelessness and, and begging, um, solicitation, essentially. Uh, and they, they did spend time in concentration camps and, and fortunately uh, survived and lived a long life um, after the war. You also see an example here of Liddy Backroff, um, who act, was a trans woman, uh, but whom the Nazis treated as simply as, as a cross-dressing gay man. And so Liddy was actually arrested and sent to the camps under paragraph 175, that law against uh, gay men or queer men, I guess I should say, any, any sex between men. But as this example shows, it also was often applied to trans women since the Nazis didn't necessarily um, recognize transness as, as a legitimate I identity. Now, other trans folks we know were arrested under paragraph 183, which was the law against lewd behavior or, or uh, disturbing the public peace. Now, the Nazis also targeted lesbians uh, and, and arrested them under a number of different laws, kind of a hodgepodge of policies and laws, including um, laws against sex with dependents, uh, the laws against child abuse, uh, or again, even paragraph 183, the law against uh, disturbing the public peace. And I'm, one of the things I want to mention is that um, under the Nazi regime, the Gestapo and the SS actually never even needed a law uh, to apprehend someone and take them into what they call protective custody uh, and send them straight to a camp. And so a lot of um, cases of lesbians that we know, actually they never even received a trial or were uh, convicted or, or charged with a particular law. They were just taken in under this generic protective custody. Um, and so here you can see an example of, of a woman who was Jewish and a lesbian um, and was sent to, to Ravensbrück. And the fact uh, her dual identities as Jewish and lesbian played a role in her arrest and persecution. Now, you would think that inheriting this national law, paragraph 175, um, already on the books would, would be something that the Nazis would celebrate. But as Dr. Atik mentioned at the beginning, the way that the original word uh, law was worded um, meant that it was usually only applied in a very narrow sense or in a particular case. And so in 1935, the Nazis decide to amend paragraph 175 um, to make it more vague. Um, and, and you can see here that the text, and I don't know if we have any uh, lawyers or law students on the call, but it says a man who commits indecency with another man or allows himself to be misused indecently will be punished. Um, and I don't know how you legally define indecency, and really that's the point. Like, it's meant to be vague so that prosecutors and judges could interpret that how they want to on a case-by-case -case basis with the sole intent of arresting as many men as possible. So paragraph 175 became an incredible, incredibly harsh tool in the Nazis' toolbox to go after queer men. Uh, and I want to say that out of the LGBTQ community, the Nazis viewed queer men as the most dangerous because, like in most other countries around the world, it was men who had access to positions of power, right? It was men who were political leaders, who were leaders in the military, in the economy. And so therefore, any type of so-called deviance in a man posed a more direct threat to the everyday running of the government, of the economy, of the military, than um, any so-called deviance amongst a woman, because in Nazi Germany, women stayed home. Uh, they didn't. They weren't allowed to have access to, to power. 
1936, all of this becomes more centralized. The Nazis create the central office for combating homosexuality and abortion. And you can tell even by the name that the, the threat that the Nazis visualize is the threat to the birth rate. Now, I want to come back to Richard Gruner, the guy whose story we started with, um, because one of the things that I found most surprising um, in this research is just how wildly popular the Nazis' homophobic and transphobic policies were amongst ordinary Germans. Um, so, for example, Richard uh, unfortunately moved to Berlin just merely weeks after Hitler had been appointed chancellor. Uh, and as I said, they start, the Nazis started closing down all of these LGBTQ meeting, place, meeting, place, sorry, meeting spaces. Uh, and since Richard came from a relatively well-to-do family, he could afford to have his own apartment in Berlin. And so he just started hosting uh, parties for his gay and lesbian friends there in his apartment. Uh, so in the, in the fall and winter of 1934, he hosts these parties, but unfortunately, one of the attendees spins the party writing down the names and addresses, or at least the names and, and professions of everyone who was in attendance. And we don't know anything about why this woman did what she did. We don't know if she was coerced to do so, if she had something against Richard or his friends, but she takes the list to the Gestapo. And ultimately, Richard Gruna and 70 other men were arrested uh, after those parties um, and sent to prison. Richard's actually sent to prison for a year and then immediately apprehended uh, by the Gestapo and taken into protective custody and sent to a camp where he spends the rest of the war. Uh, so we, we know for um, that one third of all convictions uh, under paragraph 175 stemmed from civilian denunciations, people's bosses, landlords, neighbors, even their family, turning them in to the Nazis. At one point, denunciations became such a problem in Hamburg that the Hamburg police actually had to run an article in the newspaper asking uh, Germans to quit turning in so many gay people that they were simply being overwhelmed by the number of denunciations that they needed a chance to catch up. Now, after the arrest of par or the, the amendment of paragraph 175, um, the number of convictions skyrockets. In fact, it, it rises by an astounding 740%. So in total, the Nazis arrest 100,000 uh, men and, and trans women under this law. Over half of them are convicted. Um, we don't currently have comparable statistics for the, the total number of lesbians or, or trans folks who are arrested. Like I said, they, they were arrested under all of these different policies and laws. And so um, scholars are, are currently working to, to compile these statistics so that hopefully we can have something comparable um, in, in the future. But in between, somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 so-called repeat offenders were sent to concentration camps. And, you know, anyone who was sent to a camp was ultimately labeled by one of these color-coded triangle um, badges on their uniform that denoted their so-called crime, why they were uh, sent to the camps. And for the men who were sent to the camps for breaking paragraph 175, they were marked with a pink triangle. Um, we know um, that um, lesbians and trans folks were also sent to the camps. They were they didn't have their own separate category, but they were often marked with the black triangle, which was kind of a miscellaneous category that the Nazis called asocials or, or social deviants. Now, we know that um, the horror that the men with the pink triangle in the camps faced uh, were similar to horrors that, that all the prisoners faced. But according to all of the survivor testimony that we have, whether it's from gay survivors, um, from other prisoner survivors, uh, as well as from um, SS guards and, and camp officials themselves, that um, all of them that mentioned gay people mentioned that they were treated the worst of all, that they were given the, um, the hardest work details, they were given less food. Uh, and, and all of this is because, right, transphobia and, and homophobia didn't stop at the barbed wire. It followed them into, into the gates. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, the Nazis, at least officially, tried to um, cure or re-educate uh, queer people 
Um, and they we they did it using a number of medical um, experiments and 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 uh, forced conversion therapy. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, out of all of the the men who were imprisoned for being gay, over sixty five percent of them were killed in the camp. And so this just really makes you question how um, committed the Nazis actually were to trying to uh, to uh, cure these men and, and reintegrate them back into society. Um, and I want to end uh, at least this portion with showing you Richard Gruna's um, admittance card or intake card to Flossenburg concentration camp. Um, you can see he was prisoner number 2553. You can see paragraph 175 is the reason for internment. And as if that wasn't clear enough, someone, I'm guessing a, a, a Nazi actually used a color uh, pencil to draw a pink triangle at the top right of his card. Um, Richard Gruno was incredibly uh, fortunate in the fact that he survived, because uh, as I mentioned, 65%, about two thirds of all pink triangle prisoners were killed in the camps. And so Richard Gruno um, did survive. Uh, he continued his art. And I'm not sure if you happen to notice uh, a lot of these pictures that I've been showing, including on the title slide, were actually done by Richard Gruna. Um, they were some of the very first, earliest artistic representations of what life was like in the camps. Um, and so his his testimony after the war, done through art, uh, is incredibly important for our understanding of the Holocaust. And in the last few minutes that I have, I do want to um, turn to the post-war period, because after the Nazis were defeated in May of 1945, uh, the Allies were left with the, uh, the the task of caring for the hundreds of thousands of gay, uh, sorry, of concentration camp survivors. Um, and they, they, led by the Americans, they develop a policy in which they immediately release all, everyone who had been imprisoned based on race, religion, or politics. But they said, you know what, it's too dangerous for us to release common criminals back into the general public. Um, and it perhaps would not be such a surprise to learn that the, the Americans and the other allies considered the gay prisoners to be common criminals. And so any pink triangle prisoner who had a time left on their prison sentence were taken by the Americans and the other liberators from the freed camps to a prison where they were forced to live out the rest of their, their sentence. Uh, at the same time, the Nazis, uh, the the allies were trying to get rid of all Nazi laws that they had passed in Germany. But they come to the conclusion that they're going to let the Germans decide um, what to do with paragraph 175. So in 1949, um, Germany is split up and, and created into East and West Germany. East Germany, which was the communist country, decides to go back to the original 1871 version of paragraph 175. But West Germany, um, right, which was the democracy, which was America's ally in the Cold War, decides specifically to keep the Nazi version of paragraph 175. Um, and they not only decide to, to keep it, but they use it and and you know, even though the gay folks challenged the constitutionality of this law existing in a democracy, in 1957, the German, essentially the German Supreme Court ruled that the Nazi version of paragraph 175 was still necessary to protect the moral fortitude of the German people. And so they kept it and they used it. And so if you remember that graph that I showed you a little earlier of the, you know, the number of annual convictions under paragraph 175, if you extend it um, to show its complete life, this is what it looks like. So it goes down, of course, the in 1945 with the end of the war. But by 1949, when West Germany is established, it starts going right back up. Uh, and in fact, um, between 1949 and 1969, so the first 20 years of West Germany's existence, the democratic government of West Germany uses the Nazi version of paragraph 175 to arrest 100,000 uh, queer men. That's the same number of people that the Nazis arrested using the law. So after the war, um, there is a, a man named Pierre Ciel, who was a French 
Uh, he was arrested uh, under the Nazi perse- the, the Nazi um, occupation of Germany, and he tells um, a, a reporter afterwards that liberation was only for others. And so I want to end now with a few thoughts um, on the contemporary lessons or the contemporary legacies that we can draw from this history, from the the history of paragraph 175 and national uh, federal persecution of queer and trans communities. And I think that the most important lessons that we can draw from this history actually come from those early years, from the years when Germany was transitioning from a democracy into a dictatorship. So in the 1920s and early 1930s, when Germany was still a democracy, there were a number of conservative right-wing parties that were all vying for votes in in Germany's parliament. And of course, they all had different stance on politics, the economy, and cultural issues. So as they were trying to gain support, gain voters, the Nazi party was politically savvy. They revved up their homophobic and transphobic uh, propaganda because they knew that doing so would rile up their base and would uh, unite the right in a way that other issues simply wouldn't. And as we've seen, it worked. It built a coalition of people on the right who might not have agreed on much of anything else, but they believed that the LGBTQ community could and should be uh, a target to try to reestablish so-called traditional German values. Now, during uh, a a digital event yesterday um, with the Kupferberg Center, uh, uh, Carrie Wiggum, who was a policy expert in genocide and mass atrocity prevention, showed how often the LGBTQ community is what he called a a canary in the coal mine. Uh, In other words, genocidal regimes throughout history have often attacked the LGBTQ community first as a way to build support before they move on to targeting other groups. We saw that uh, in in the case of Nazi Germany. The Nazis told Germans that queer and trans people were trying to seduce their children into the homosexual lifestyle and that they were degrading traditional German values. Now, does that sound familiar today? It should. Homophobia and transphobia have long been a tool of conservative extremism. Politicians and the media call queer and trans people groomers, right? They call them threat to children. Uh, And that leads to ordinary people, even teenagers, feeling allowed or even empowered to carry out uh, transphobic slurs, homophobic, uh, uh, you know, bullying, stereotyping, or even carrying out violence. So I want to leave you now in my last minute with three lessons from this history to think about. The first lesson is I think that it is absolutely important in the face of historical erasure. Uh, And we we have everything from public figures on Twitter trying to erase queer and trans history to state governments trying to erase queer and trans history. It is more important now than ever that we have to remember, right? We have to tell the truth and free this history from the closet. This can no longer be a history that only LGBTQ folks know about and care about. Because when we, for example, separate the LGBTQ component from the history of the Holocaust, or from American history for that matter, um, people, learners, students don't realize how dangerous uh, and lethal homophobia and transphobia can be when it's backed by the government. But it's not enough just to remember. It's not enough to just know this history. Remembering has to have consequences. So second, the the second lesson I want you to take away is that we have to act, right? We have to push back against homophobia, um, whether it is around the kitchen table with our family or on campus or in the workplace. We have to fight against transphobia, yes, on election day, but also every single day. And finally, and this one might actually be the hardest, we have to show up for each other, right? We have to recognize that the fight against 
anti sorry, the fight against uh, transphobia and homophobia also has to be the fight against anti-Semitism and racism and ableism and other forms of sy systemic discrimination. Because really, solidarity is our greatest strength. So the LGBTQ community, despite what some politicians are saying, has every right to exist. Right? And not just quietly in the closet or in the, the privacy of our own homes, but visibly in history books, in, in high school curriculum, every single way that we talk about the world and our place in it, LGBTQ folks, queer and trans people, have a right to be seen. Now, the history of the pink triangle, the history of paragraph 175, shows us how far homophobia and transphobia can go, and it's up to us to decide how far we let it go today. Thank you very much. And while we are waiting or, or gathering questions or thoughts, I will just leave this up on the on the screen in case you want to uh, learn more about any of this history in depth or find out ways that you can uh, get involved with this work. Uh, we uh, invite you to visit our website or follow us on social media. Thank you. Um, I'm looking in the chat right now, and a lot of the questions I'm seeing are about uh, gender. Um, and the differences between men and women um, and the way they were persecuted, particularly during the Nazi era. Do you think you could talk a little bit more about that briefly? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, this has been an ongoing topic really since, um, since the 70s when a, a handful of kind of grassroots, um, mostly queer themselves scholars went into the archives to start telling this history because the mainstream historical society just ignored it and said, you know what, there's no history there to, to tell. And so it was left up to the queer community themselves to, to research and tell this history. And from early on, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of gay cisgender male activists and, and historians said, well, you know, women weren't um, included in paragraph 175, and so therefore lesbians weren't really persecuted. Um, and I think that is such a, a wrong assessment of the, the reality of lesbians in the Third Reich, um, because just because you weren't uh, legally or, or officially convicted with a particular law, that's not the only way to be persecuted. Um, and so we know, for example, that, as I said, it's essentially Nazi misogyny and their understandings of gender and gender roles that kept the Nazis from um, including lesbians in the law. But it's also, um, we have the minutes of a meeting where the Nazis were actually sitting there, you know, discussing whether, like what what threat did lesbians play to the, the, the Nazi project, the Nazi a quest to forge a, a master race. Um, and so we actually have some quite explicit uh, discussions of, of them articulating why they felt that they were not quite as dangerous as, as um, queer men. And ultimately, the, the guy who became the minister of justice, which, you know, what an oxymoron in, if we're talking about the Nazi regime, but um, says that ultimately it doesn't matter all these arguments that you're making. And I, and I quote that the uh, unlike men, women are always prepared for sex. Uh, and so they, they essentially decide that if you remember, the ultimate goal of the Nazi party was the procreation of the master race. And so the Nazis felt that it doesn't matter if a woman is gay, straight or what, they can be impregnated by force if necessary to have children for the nation. Um, and so they essentially just said, we're not going to waste um, you know, government resources on combating this because we'll just essentially lock them up and, and make sure that they have children for us. Um, so I, I don't want to, to kind of give the impression that because they weren't um, under paragraph 175 that they, you know, escaped persecution. Uh, it was absolutely impossible for um, any queer trans people to live openly as, as you know, themselves. Um, 
And we we know, for example, I, I, there were many, many cases of, of lesbians being sent to the camps um, where their, their being lesbian was, if not the only factor, was certainly a factor in, while, in why they were, were targeted. Um, it, it, I would say some in some cases it was it could have been easier for some lesbians to hide because the Nazis simply weren't like studying them as hard. Um, but that certainly doesn't mean that they weren't weren't persecuted. I hope that answers everyone's questions. I'm happy to go deeper if we want, but I hope that that was sufficient. I see another really interesting question about um, if there are any recorded or written um, things from the point of view of people who were arrested. Um, under these laws and taken to the camps. And I know there are, but I was wondering if you could provide um, and we can put it in the chat as well so students can access it. Yeah, so um, one of the, the projects that that um, we at the Pink Triangle Legacies Project are, are working on um, is what we call the LGBTQ Stories from Nazi Germany Initiative. So you can go to our website, pinktrianglelegacies.org slash stories. Um, and we are compiling you know, biographies of these, these individuals. Unfortunately, um, because of that continued use of paragraph 175 after the war, because of continued homophobia and transphobia, um, only a small handful of survivors ever went on record to tell their story. Um, and most of them did so when they were you know, in their 70s, 80s, or even, even later. Um, and so unfortunately, we just don't have as many as we do for other victim groups, um, for example. Uh, but you can find as many as we can gather. We, we have them on our website. We have a YouTube channel where we've you know, if there are if they're available on YouTube, we've put them uh, in playlist for you. Um, if you also, uh, it's kind of hard to find and, and and watch online. But if you get a chance to watch a documentary called Paragraph One Seventy Five, um, it's from the year two thousand. Uh, but it is still, I, in my opinion, the best documentary that's that's on the topic. And they do interview. I think it's ten um, ten gay survivors, and most of them went on the record, kind of. You know, with a pseudonym, uh, but that you you really get to hear directly from gay survivors about their experiences in that documentary. Um, we have another really interesting question. Um, this person asks, "Can you please speak to the later use in the '60s and '70s of the pink triangle as a symbol of pride and liberation for the growing LGBTQ plus movement, and how yeah. that was um, how how that transformed in its in its meaning?" Yeah, absolutely. So uh, beginning in the, the early 70s, um, I guess late 60s, early 70s, uh, the, the, the act of coming out, right, of publicly claiming your gay or, you know, your LGBTQ identity um, became not just a personal decision, it really was a political tactic. Um, and, you know, folks were arguing that, hey, in a democracy, we shouldn't have to be in the closet to escape persecution. Like we should be able to live openly, proudly, and still not be persecuted. <laughs> um, and so in West Germany, uh, some of the gay activists were saying, you know what, well, we should all find a way to out ourselves, collectively out ourselves, and we should wear a gay symbol. And so, of course, there was a lot of debate about, well, what is a gay symbol? How do we, how do we wear something that would essentially advertise or market ourselves as gay. Um, and in 1972, a book called The Men with the Pink Triangle came out. It was the very first um, book written by a gay concentration camp survivor. Uh, it was written under the pseudonym Heinz Hager. And these gay activists said, that's it. Like, it's the pink triangle. Because they knew that their West German counterparts, their, you know, their, their straight society would instantly recognize that triangle as a concentration camp badge. Like it would need no explanation. But in, in wearing it voluntarily, they were saying, you know what, we are going to rob this symbol of its negative connotation. You know, it was originally meant that pink triangle meant gay was uh, shameful, meant to be persecuted, but we're saying it's in no way shameful and we're going to wear it with pride. So that was uh, the first time in 1972 and it really took off after that so that by the time um, most people think of ACT UP using it with the silence equals death poster, um, but that was about 15 years later, it had already been kind of in currency as a 
uh, gay activist logo for for 15 years before that. That's great information. Um, this is maybe my own question, um, but uh, given the context that's going on right now um, and kind of the environment of fear that mm -hmm. um, is being created, um, is it useful as power part of the counter rhetoric that we have to right continue to like articulate um, to bring up this history um, specifically and directly? Um, because I'm, you know, it's a very scary time, and we're, you know, I currently don't see uh, an endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if this or other rhetorical rhetorical strategies or what else you might suggest um, as we kind of advocate for. Um, the community. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and I do think that this history is a is a can be a, a powerful tool in our continued fight for not only equality but just existence mm -hmm. and and physical safety um, these days because it shows, as I said, how far homophobic rhetoric can go if left unchecked. It can it can lead to violence. It can lead to state sanctioned. Uh, policies and laws. And I think, you know, one of the dangers of folks like J.K. Rowling taking to Twitter and, and you know, saying, you know what, trans folks weren't targeted, is it's not just that it's factually wrong. It, number one, dismisses that this has happened before. And it distracts from the fact that if you delete the history, erase the history, it also hides the fact that the rhetoric being used today by anti-LGBTQ um, parties is eerily almost word for word what the Nazis used. And so it like it it helps it helps justify their anti-LGBTQ stance because they hide how it was used in the past. And so I think you know when we kind of respond to and defend against those uh, those types of stances, it's important for us actually to dig into the details. It's not enough for us to say, hey, you sound like a Nazi, because actually the left and the right kind of does, like the Nazi has become the political boogeyman, right? But so we have to be able to go kind of beyond that stereotype and say, this is exactly the types of rhetoric that was used and led to violence, massive violence against the LGBTQ community. The fact that books were burned and and banned, right? We kind of like burning the books was was the epitome or the the hyperbole of it. But like before that, they also just banned it. They made it. They they censored it. And so we see that happening today. And we know. I think so many times folks will say, "Well, what are you arguing that there's going to be Auschwitz in America now?" Um, and not necessarily. I mean, I, I think that history has shown us that's one possibility of what can happen. But I think that we also have to, when Auschwitz, when the Holocaust becomes our measuring stick for what's bad enough, we let ourselves off the hook for when, like things don't have to be Auschwitz to be bad, to be violent, to be dangerous. Um, and so that's where I, that's why I think that these, these examples from the early history, the 1920s, the 1930s are actually more relevant and and educational for us today. And we really, I think we really do need to make this a detailed understanding of this history as accessible as possible. One last note that I wanted to comment on that just to make the connections to the present day is this um, continued appeal to the family, right? Mm. The nuclear family, the protecting of the children. And just thinking about our last event, which was also, uh, which was on, book bans, right, and how it's been spearheaded by a tiny minority of mostly women um, who are um, trying to ban an ounce of sexuality or, you know, any kind of, like, racism in the books. Um, but what has been gratifying is that they've been losing momentum and losing steam. And so, and I think that's heartening, that even though in the face of all of the, the campaigns, right, is that we have I really, we have communities around the country who are earnestly trying to resist and stamp out this divisive, hateful, false rhetoric against um, LGBTQIA plus community. So thank you. I think we need to end here though, unless you want to comment on that, Dr. Newsom. 
you know, I, I think you, you, I think you said it perfectly that this, there's a lot of um, things to be distressed about, but there is, there, there is, you know, glimmers of hope there that we really need to to cling to and, and uplift um, so that it is so that we don't burn out in this fight. Uh, we we need to we need to have that motivation. So I, I appreciate you also naming that and 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 putting that out there for us. Well, I think having you here is an example of that. I hope. And it sounds like our panelists um, uh, learned a lot and took a lot from your from your talk. So thank you very much. Um, thank you to the Kupferberg Holocaust Center for sponsoring and hosting this event. Thank you, Dr. Newsom, for your expertise. Elisa, any last comments? I, I feel very grateful and very honored to have you here and talking to our faculty and to our students. And um, uh, just, I want to thank you for your time and for your expertise. So, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for logging on. Thanks for the just, in, um, yeah, the, the great support. I really appreciate it. And go to his website. Yes, please. I have it all written down. <laughs> go to his website. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. everyone. Take Bye -bye. care. You all.